friends, I'm Rev. Nate Melcher of Richfield United Methodist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and welcome to Episode 8 of Camp Meetings. This is a live variety show with music, prayer, comedy, guests, and connection. I'm so glad that you're here tonight. We get our name Camp Meetings from the camp meetings across the nation in the 1800s that brought people in isolation together for building faith and building community. And in these times of pandemic, we could use some camp meetings right now. This is episode four of season two of Camp Meeting, season two. This is Easter Ride. And that's because the season is in Eastertide, the season of Easter, that's before Pentecost. Look, just roll with it, okay? Uh, speaking of rolling with it, later on we're going to talk about our fourth vehicle in honor of season two, episode four. Tell us about your fourth vehicle in the comments. But first, let's sing. Let's turn things over to one of our worship music leaders at Richfield United Methodist Church, Victor Zupank, as he leads us in For the Beauty of the Earth. Hi everybody, I hope you're doing well. I'm going to sing that old chestnut of a hymn, For the Beauty of the Earth. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Lord of all, to you we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the beauty of each hour of the day and of the night, hill and vale and tree and flower, sun and moon and stars of light. Lord of all, to you we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. Amen. Thank you, Victor. Friends, I invite you to a time of prayer, and we're going to use the Breakthrough Prayer for Richfield United Methodist Church. If you're watching and you're part of a different worshiping body, that's okay. You can use this prayer with your community in mind. Tonight's reading is done by my oldest daughter, Gertie. Take it away, Gertie. Hey church, it's me, Gertie. Will you do the Breakthrough Prayer with me? Loving God of all, renew our hearts and minds. Reveal your wildest dreams. Be true to each of us. Unite us in your vision. Equip us for your work. Transform us by your song. Create our harmony. May we embrace your future and be a loving church. Amen. Thanks, Gertie. Now go to bed. Or maybe you're already in bed? I don't know. Having a live premiere of a pre-recorded video is weird. How do those people on TV do it? Let's talk fourth vehicles, friends, as it's the fourth episode of the Easter ride season. My fourth vehicle was the 1996 Buick Regal sedan. I bought it for $3,000 flat from a dealer who was selling it for like $3,800, something like that. I said, let's do three. He said, well, then I won't make a dime on it. And I said, no, thank you. And I hung up and about an hour later, he called me back after he talked to his manager. This car was uh, the car that I had right when I was leaving Wyoming to move back to Minnesota after that Ford Explorer broke down for the last time. And it was with me when I met my spouse. In fact, my spouse Kelly calls this my old man car because when we showed up to our first date in the parking lot of Psycho Susie's, I parked here and she parked there and she looked over and she saw this beige Buick and then a guy in a, in a winter cap, it's one of those like, you know, pullover old man slash newspaper newsies kind of hats. And she thought, how, how old is this guy anyway? Uh, at any rate, uh, like many of my cars, it, it did break down plenty. In fact, my last ride in this car was very memorable. I was going down to Iowa to pick up my cousins for a weekend up in the cities. And my car just stopped working. The engine just stopped working on 35 southbound and I was just getting to those outlet malls at Medford and I had just enough speed to go into neutral and then coast up the exit ramp and then that little roundabout and finally coast into the McDonald's parking lot and then I called a tow truck and because of the radius of where they could take me they took me down to Iowa 
I borrowed my parents' van and I took the kids up for the weekend, dropped the car in my uncle's shop in Manly, and uh, then I started to car shop. And that's another story. I like this car a lot. Of all the seven vehicles that I've had, I've had a hatchback, a station wagon, an SUV, sedan, another sedan, an MPV, and a minivan. I've got to put the Buick Regal in my top three. I like the sedan a lot. It was my first car that I had that wasn't my parents or something that I bought with like college money. It's money that I, I earned for my first job out of college and I paid it all off before coming to Minnesota. And I remember feeling really proud and really grown up back then at the age of 25. That was 15 years ago. Wow, that's a long time. Well, that car lasted around three years. And we can talk about the next car in the next episode. Tell us about your car, your fourth vehicle in the comments. I think about that last ride where the car just, just plain stopped and I had to put it in neutral and get it up the exit ramp. You'd think that that would be stressful, but really it was kind of soothing. It was it's like visiting the ocean, just a long, beautiful coast. That was tonight's sneak attack pun. Sneak attack puns are not brought to you by Impeccable Yarn. Learn about Impeccable Yarn and get in the loop. All right, let's take a little hand sanitizer break here. I'm gonna do one hand at a time and Oh, I can't, um, oh no, that's, oops. Friends, you may notice that for the first time ever, Camp Meetings is 100% pre-recorded and edited, and now it's premiering live on the internet, what they call simulated live. Right now, I'm actually at home watching this along with you, or this is the future, and I'm not. Two months ago when I started camp meetings as a fun pop-up ministry during these times of the COVID-19 pandemic, I specifically chose our Wednesday at 8.30 p.m. time slot because I knew I could commit to doing that. Uh, I'm often doing something with ministry on a Wednesday night, the workday is done, the kids are in bed, and I wouldn't be missing Matlock in the morning while I have my coffee. However, I wanted tonight to go off without a hitch. You see, when I look back at our previous seven episodes, I noticed that we had, well, a few technical glitches. I'm trying to see if it's going. I can't quite tell. This is the first time I've done this before. So, so uh, as we wrap up, I, I'm going to see if I can move my, I have a second screen over here and I'm going to, um, let's get me up there. I want a picture of me. How do I make it just be me? I, I'm, we're learning so much about technology, friends. Is here we are at Lenten a tent. All right, still don't have you, Barb. I don't know if you can see this. I believe if I do this, it'll give us a gallery view, so we're side by side. Uh, Pastor Rich, can you hear me? But in the meantime, I encourage you to go to her uh, her thing that I just paused again. Lord of all to thee we praise. I found the wrong chords for the song. <laughs> this didn't sound good at all. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna invite you again. All right. Oh, you muted yourself. Good. All right. So uh, let's uh, unpin that video, which will bring up me, I believe. No, no. It's just. I don't know what I'm doing. I thought I knew what I was doing. So how are we doing on the reboot? Maybe you didn't notice any of those. You did not notice any of those. But I did. And I wanted to avoid that for tonight's episode, so I specifically carved out some time this week to shoot, edit, and post all of this in advance so that when it's time for Premiere Live, I can use Wednesday at 8.30 p.m. to already be in bed, stone cold out sleeping from the sheer physical and emotional exhaustion I feel every day of the pandemic. Anyway. My favorite glitch is probably the patience Carol and Dave showed for the process of our interview as it dropped every four minutes from the live stream as we talked about the general conference a few weeks ago. Uh, point. Hold on, I think we cut. Sorry. I hope that they will be open Hold to on. that. We, we, we paused again. So it's definitely every four minutes. I like timed it.
So weird. Well, sorry this happened in because it's, you know, stressful for you, I'm sure. If it was worship, I think I'd be really stressed. This is this is supposed to be just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> so we're <laughs> so we're talking about general conference. Carol and Dave, you were such good sports about it. Thank you. My least favorite tech glitch probably is my attempt to sing for the beauty of the earth two weeks in a row, and it did not go well at all. You saw a clip of that in the montage. You know, the other clip was actually edited into oblivion. It's my least favorite glitch because it wasn't the live stream technology's fault. It was more like user error or singer error. I don't know. But that glitch did have my favorite solution, get Victor to sing it instead. There's a story in the Bible that on the surface has a weird technical glitch. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verses 22 through 26, there's a unique story of Jesus healing someone. It goes like this. They came to Bethsaida. Some people brought a blind man to Jesus and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. And when he had put saliva on his eyes and laid hands on him, he asked him, can you see anything? And the man looked up and said, I can see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he looked intently and his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. The weird stories are kind of the best stories sometimes. Why does Jesus have to attempt to heal this guy twice? Did the first time not take? Was there a technical glitch with the power of the Lord? Maybe he just needed more spit. You know, personally, I'm always finding that when I rub my spit on people, it's never enough. And I apologize for that. The man says that he sees people, but they look like trees walking. Um, That's actually kind of cool. I'd like to see the special effect version in the movie. Maybe this is a precursor to the Ents in Lord of the Rings. Jesus takes his time with this man to continue his healing process. For this man, healing doesn't come all at once. It takes special time and effort to get there. Out of curiosity, how often do you see things clearly the first time? How often do you get it right instantaneously? No process or journey needed. Yeah, me either. Many times in life, we get a glimpse of something good. We see potential, yet we get excited for what comes and even if ultimately we don't get the whole picture. A little while before this story, in Mark chapter 7, Jesus heals a person who cannot hear, and they are healed immediately. Sometimes when it comes to the healing presence of Jesus in our lives, we do just get it. We don't have to go searching very far to feel and then share this love of Jesus. But then there's a story here of someone who catches a glimpse of something good, but needs a little more work to get there completely. And I have to be honest, I think I likely have more processes in my life, like here in chapter 8 of Mark, than I do the instantaneous moment of that story in chapter seven. Later in chapter eight, immediately after this man sees clearly, Jesus asks his disciples, who do they think he is? They've been on this journey with him a lot. They should have an idea by now, yes? And Simon Peter gets brave and he says, you are the Messiah. And Jesus says, you're right, aha, Simon Peter gets it. And then Jesus says, by the way, if I follow this trajectory, it's gonna lead to my death. And Simon Peter says, no, no, absolutely not. You can't let this happen. And then Jesus says that classic line, get behind me, Satan. Don't tempt me. Jesus says, see me and this journey and what it's all about clearly. In my life and death and resurrection, I'm with you in all of this. Simon Peter catches a glimpse of something good, but needs a little more work to get there completely. Long before the pandemic, many of us understood or felt the many social justice concerns and inequity challenges in our nation. Some of us took our knowledge or understanding to the next level and we took action to help. And some of us, well, we get that things need to be better, but perhaps didn't see clearly enough to understand our role to take action and change things. You can feel really bad, you can be paralyzed by guilt, or you can shake it off and take action and do it. Stumbling or wandering or being paralyzed from knowing 
whether or not or how to take action, those aren't technical glitches. Those are part of your story as it unfolds, as you begin to see more clearly how to share that love of Jesus. So you can continue to see it in your life and how you need to share it with other people to make this world the place it needs to be for justice and equality. So may you see this love, a love that calls you to act and serve the risen Christ. Amen. Friends, our next guest is uh, the founder of Sojourner Magazine and a public theologian. His latest book is Christ in Crisis, and we're so glad to have him here. Please welcome Reverend Jim Wallace. Hello, Jim. How are you today? Hey, good, good to see you again. We're glad to have you. You're in Washington, yes. D.C., is that correct? I am. I am. Uh, what, what's the word on the street in Washington, D.C.? You, you probably shouldn't know. You should probably be at home, but <laughs> what's the vibe out there? Well, I walk a lot. Um, I think everybody is wanting to get back to something. And yet people here are very uh, cautious. And I think people here listen to the docs, doctors and scientists and really are trying to uh, take it seriously. So I'm not seeing a rushing back, uh, though things are, uh, there's more people in the street when I walk now than a couple of weeks ago, more traffic. But yeah. so I think people are, are, are waiting. And whether school's gonna be on the fall, my two boys are home. so. Those are our, our mealtime conversations, what we expect for the summer, baseball tournaments, uh, when's going on, these baseball showcases, if they're happening. So all that, that's our usual fare. But then also what's going on around the country is our usual fare here because we're in conversation with people like you all the time. Well, we appreciate it. Uh, I want to ask, can you tell us about Sojourners and uh, I, I've been a long time subscriber of Sojourners. I'm a big fan of the magazine. Uh, but uh, what can you tell us about Sojourners? And one of the things I appreciate about it is that uh, how theology and in politics can go hand in hand, especially now. What are you doing with Sojourners about that? Well, we've been at this a long time, and it's about faith and public life. Mm. There's a lot of conversation about faith and personal life. What's my personal faith? But my whole vocation is, how do you take real personal faith public? What does it mean in the public square, in our neighborhoods, our communities, here in Congress, uh, and around the world? So how do you take faith public? And now, how do you take faith public in COVID? This One of the phrases that you're well known for saying is, uh, faith is always personal, it is never private. Yeah, when I was uh, a kid of a boy a long time ago, <laughs> going back and forth to uh, my city in Detroit, and I met the black churches, and nobody in my white Christian world wanted to ever talk about what was happening in Detroit. And I kept being drawn to want to find out. And uh, when I was told by an elder in my church that that was just uh, not a good use of my time, he said, Christianity has nothing to do with racism. That's political. Our faith is personal. And that's the night that I left in my head and my heart uh, because I didn't have words for it back then, but later it was God is personal. Faith is personal, but never private. Mm -hmm. So the privatizing of our faith is the greatest heresy of American church life. Mm -hmm. I like the way you put that too. I think people talk about uh, faith and politics, that, that feels tough for people, but I like how you talk about faithful living and public life. Uh, even as terminology, like, I, can, I can grip that a little bit easier, I think. Well, and I learned from the black churches when they welcomed me in a long time ago as a teenage kid, white kid with all these questions, there was no separation there. Yeah. There was like life is life, you know? And uh, when uh, next week in the Congress, you're gonna have faith leaders across the spectrum, theologically and politically, saying, we've gotta deliver SNAP, food, to hungry people that will feed hungry people and actually stimulate the economy. So we're together in saying, feeding hungry people uh, is not only Matthew 25, where Jesus says, I was hungry, where were you? But it's also very practical, so how do you, increase there's food lines all over the country right now so how do we change that 
how do we how do we begin to feed people the way we we ought to, which actually will put money back in the economy. So it's always what does faith mean right now for our public life? That's what Sojourners has done for years, and we're sojo.net. You can see it every single day. Uh, how do we apply faith, a real deep personal faith, to our public, political, economic life, particularly in terms of uh, racial justice? Absolutely. How is your work as a public theologian in a, in a peace and just advocate, how has that changed or how has it remained the same in the face of pandemic? The pandemic has revealed what already was. COVID has laid everything bare. Yeah. What was normal <laughs> that we were ignoring or denying for a long time can't be denied any, any, anymore. When black Americans, including black Christians, get sicker three times from this virus as whites do, three to one, and die six times to one, that's verifiable. That's happening all the time. Racism and poverty are now preconditions for getting and dying of this virus. So that reveals the gaping inequalities in our, our systems, healthcare system, education economy, all the essential workers, we call them now, uh, mm -hmm. overwhelmingly people of color and women of color not being paid a living wage. If they're essential, why aren't we paying them a living wage? Mm -hmm. Isn't it clear now that universal health care for all of us would make us all healthier? Uh, uh, Freddie Haynes, a renowned uh, national uh, revival preacher, said to me the other day, King once said, you know, this quote that I've preached on forever, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. You know that quote, you probably preached it. He says, infection anywhere is a threat to infection everywhere. Yeah. We are together one, one way or the other. And so right now um, you have uh, this, this plague, especially attacking the most vulnerable. And that, uh, that means people of color. Yeah. So I think you hear that on the news and I'm hearing you now and, and still one of my big questions is what does ally action look like for marginalized communities, for communities being impacted the most by this in these early days of the pandemic? And I wish I wasn't saying early days, but I think we're in the early days of pandemic. Well, what does ally action even look like? You know, um, uh, it means that just uh, swapping pulpits once a year with a black church or having their choir and our, your choir uh, go to once a year uh, isn't enough. It means that what does our relationship mean? For example, in a pandemic like this, how are we learning from, Corinthians says, when one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. Is that true? Uh, is this a Corinthian moment? What does it mean? Uh, and another very pra practical thing, I'm having calls every week uh, with like 80 black pastors in Florida who want to protect the vote of black people in Florida. Yeah. Because black people were, votes were suppressed. Georgia, and Florida, lots of places. So Sojourners has this thing called Lawyers and Collars. Uh, clergy and lawyers, often from their churches, are going to polling places and secretaries of state to to protect, really, it's theological, imago Dei. The image of God is the issue, not politics. And are white people afraid of black people voting? Why is that? Are white Christians afraid of black Christians voting? Why is that? So let's talk. So I want to see multiracial and white churches supporting Black pastors, we picked out seven key states uh, that we got, we're going to, for voter turnout and protection, uh, that is crucial. It's, a, it's really a theological uh, and a public campaign. So allies need to protect the lives and the votes of um, uh, black churches and black members of the body of Christ who our lives and votes are literally at stake. No. Yeah. Pandemic. Is Minnesota one of those seven states? 
we, we have tremendous racial disparities here in Minnesota. You do, and uh, your uh, lieutenant governor is somebody I'm very close to. She's pretty cool. Peggy Flanagan. Uh, we, she's really part of my family in lots of ways, stays with us here. And uh, I'm having Peggy on a phone call with faith leaders from around the country this, this Friday to talk about reopening, the challenges for, for a governor like Peggy who looks at things from the perspective of marginalized people. She's an indigenous Native American woman, highest ranking political indigenous leader in the country. And she and uh, you know, Governor Waltz are trying to open in a way that is safe. And, and so what she's trying to do is what I'd like to see governors doing all over the country. So Minnesota is a critical state for Minnesota and the few future, but I'm talking about those contested electoral states like Michigan and Wisconsin. So some of, some of your neighbors are on that list. Yeah. Well, Min Min Minnesota's critical to all of that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it, it's been interesting to hear uh, in the midst of pandemic, people are asking questions about November and saying, well, should we have mail-in voting a little more easily accessible, et cetera? And, and then you hear some folks go, no, 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 we, we don't need that. And, and you think what's all behind them not wanting more accessible voting? I think you raised some really good questions. That's a good question. What's behind people not wanting more accessible voting or not wanting in North Carolina, there were these new laws that went to court in North Carolina and the North Carolina court not Jim Wallace or Peggy Flanagan. The North Carolina court said these laws are surgically aimed at repressing black votes. Now, why are white people afraid of black people voting? Why are white Christians afraid? This is a big question. So your question is one that your listeners should answer because people don't want populations, minority, younger and now elderly populations to vote. Why is that? So let's, let's see this as, this is not only nonpartisan, this is, let's call this, let's get souls to the polls. I like it. <laughs> These are souls made in the image of God and they deserve a right to, to vote. So that could, that could be a common effort. In fact, we've got a letter going to Congress, every member of Congress and the Senate signed by almost all the black denominational leaders and uh, many of the white denominations, including white evangelicals, like the National Association of Evangelicals has signed this letter calling for free and fair and safe elections. So we'll need mail voting, which is very uh, effective, absentee voting and in-person vote, voting. We'll need all of that. And where we are in November, who knows? But whatever, wherever we are, how to get the most people to be able to vote should be a goal for all of us. I like that. As a church, we've been thinking about our system for worship right now. We can't do in-person worship, so we've gone to online only. But uh, as a people, we need to realize we will never again be only in-person, and God willing, we'll be beyond online only someday. It will be a hybrid for the remainder of the life of the church. And so I think about you saying we need all these kinds of voting, not just in person, in absentee, but mail in, that this needs to become a new normal way of doing this as a system to fix the system. Yeah, I've been, uh, the federal government where I'm in Washington DC, in my view, clearly isn't offering the leadership needed in this pandemic, which has been offered in the past by both Republican and Democratic presidents. This is not being offered now. However, the civil society, uh, the nonprofit sector is working in many ways pretty pretty well, and faith communities are part of that. My church is also very virtual, uh, and and in some ways people are getting closer, uh, and they're figuring out how to reach out to people. Who? How do we prevent social distancing from leading to social isolation? To me, that's kind of the vocation of the churches right now. How do we? keep our distance for the health of all. In other words, you don't, you don't, you don't uh, if you love your neighbor, you, you don't have worships too close, which makes them all sick. But then how do you reach out to people, especially if they're isolated? 
elderly folks. I, I see amazing things. Young people using their phones to figure out which elderly person needs some food and they take them some food and leave it on the doorstep and wave good, 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 goodbye. And, you know, so there's all kinds of creative things. And in, in fact, in my church, district church here in DC, uh, Aaron Graham from used to be at Sojourners now has this amazing church. Uh, the numbers are growing of people who are coming online. Uh, and some people who weren't even churchgoers are looking for some inspiration, some sustenance, some, some help getting through the week. So this will change us. Mm -hmm. It's a time of great spiritual curiosity, for sure. Yeah, it really is, yeah. And if it really, if it helps us to focus on each other, particularly the most vulnerable, which is what Jesus says to do, uh, it can really help change our ways of worshiping, acting, living in our neighborhoods. So I, I want to be open to some real opportunity here for the church to really be the church, particularly for those who are uh, indeed being revealed as the most vulnerable here. Right. So a lot of people are, are more staying at home than before. Some people feel stuck at home and they've had the isolation factor. Uh, but many of the people who are staying at home used to be very active in their communities to do things like compassion ministries, you know, sandwich making, sandwich delivering, or do some justice ministries going on in March. There's not going to be a lot of uh, marches these days. Uh, so I'm curious, people at home, they want to get active. They want to fight for justice for people, especially people uh, who are more at, at risk during the pandemic. What's one thing? that people watching can do right now to uh, activate their faith in their public life, even if they're at home in the long run? Yeah. Well, this, the best thing about this time for me is storytelling, yeah. telling stories of people who are doing things. So I, at, at sojo.net, we have a thing, sojo.net slash coronavirus. It's full of answers to that question what people are doing in their churches and their communities and for advocacy uh, you can advocate from your home uh, to your members of congress and senate next week uh, so joe Danette lays out the issues that will be being voted on you can advocate uh, I, we've got a senator coming on our phone call this week with faith leaders from around the country about that uh, and so uh, you can act, you can reach out. My church is re reaching out around the city to find vulnerable people. Uh, and so even our relation to each other as congregations could grow during the, the, this time. So, so this online time, uh, we need to be very, we need to listen to the doctors, listen to docs and the scientific experts. But this is going to, transform us and I think it can bring us closer together even though we're all believe me two teenage or one teenage boy and one 21 year old athletes uh, uh, shelter at home basketball court right outside uh, my garage here and I mean I do need to say that you know as a 71 year old guy I beat them in a game of horse last week but you know, just uh, uh, here folks exclusive but you know, one on one, not so much. Uh, but but you know, it, if it focuses focuses us not just on ourselves, but we can listen and pay attention to what's happening around us, and that could change us in our relationship to each other as congregations and to the vulnerable in our community. So this could wake us up and show us things. Learnings from this mm. could take us forward to a different and new place. I love that because I think there are local churches who are who are nervous about the future of their own church. If yeah. there are churches who are already hurting to, to keep going, this is just compounding that. And so you're looking to how can you keep your own church afloat? So you're looking inward, but you're also talking about to be the church is to look outward and, and you get that new revival in your heart. And that might be a piece of keeping that church going, uh, even if it had struggled already. I think it's crucial, as I said before, uh, God is personal but never private. And I think if our church has been just personal and just together in the room uh, once a week, 
that's not what the church is about. We're about we're about serving the community. That's what it means. That's what Jesus taught us at the beginning. And if this time helps us to learn that better, we will be a better and stronger church uh, afterwards. I like it. I, yeah, I, that's interesting. I thought that church was just a building once an, once an hour a week. I didn't, okay, well, and now I learned something. Thank you for that. Uh, Jim, before we wrap up, it's uh, episode four of our season of camp meetings called Easter Ride. So Easter Tide, Easter Ride. And uh, in each episode, I'm asking people about their vehicles. Since it's episode four, uh, I was talking about my fourth vehicle. Do you remember what your fourth vehicle was? And do you have any fun memories of it? My fourth vehicle? Yeah. Maybe you've lived in places with enough public transportation. I don't know how many vehicles you've owned, but uh, do you remember what your fourth one was? Oh, way back in the day? Uh, probably was a, a community car back in the old days of Sojourners. Uh, we had these community cars, and when a car is a community car, no one really takes care of it. <laughs> so we had these competitions with a Catholic worker in New York about who had the worst cars. And uh, probably the, my entry was driving to a speaking engagement once and the steering wheel came off while I was driving to a speaking engagement. It's tough to figure out what to do when your steering wheel comes off a car. So that was, that was probably my fourth and fifth and sixth were in that category. But where where a logical statement there about a steering wheel being missing. <laughs> well, uh, we also had an a engine catch on fire once. That wasn't very good either. But but sharing cars was was a part of our early discipline. So so generous. So the steering wheel came came off. Uh, but the question though, you're you're raising about Easter. Let me, let me just say this: Easter isn't a day; wow. it's a season. Mm -hmm. And it took a while for Jesus' disciples, the earliest ones to even realize that he'd risen from the dead or to believe it and not doubt it or understand what that could mean for the future. So when the President of the United States says Easter should be the time where we open the economy and go back to normal, which he said a few weeks back, that's not only a reckless public, that's a fundamental misunderstanding of Easter. Easter has never been a time to go back to normal. Mm. Don't go back to normal Easter. Easter is, I can make all things new. So here's the Christ on the cross, Good Friday, nailed to the cross, saying to us, I can't stop your coronavirus suffering, but I'm with you in it. Yeah. And here's Sunday, this Jesus beckoning with his hands. I can make all things new. Join me. Let's together learn what we've learned from this and together make all things new. That's an Easter season in a, a, corona, in a coronavirus crisis to make all things new. Preach it, I love it. Jim, we're gonna send people to sojo.net and it sounds like sojo.net slash coronavirus. Yeah. And, Lots of stories and there's podcasts there. Uh, one with Peggy Flanagan, your Lieutenant Governor, just about what does the governor do in all this? So that would be it, because it's about Minnesota. So they can check out Peggy podcast last week. Your latest book is Christ in Crisis, and we can get people up to that. Any other organizations that you're partnering with that people should know about? Are, are you familiar with like Dr. Barber's Poor People? Sure, uh, yeah. Anything well, else? The, sub, the subtitle for the book is what I'm really, why we reclaim Jesus. <laughs> why we need to reclaim Jesus. And coming, maybe, maybe this crisis will help bring us back to Jesus. That's what I want to see. Yeah, Dr. Barber's going to march uh, visually, virtually, in June for what, what he's doing. So you can do lots of things. You said we couldn't march. Well, he's going to march. Uh, we're going to join him in that in June. So uh, virtual marching. Well, we're trying all this new stuff out, so I strongly support that. It's a time to try something new. Jim, thank you so much for all of your time. I appreciate it. My uh, and FYI, the last time we were together, uh, you were visiting Minnesota, and you had to use my church credit card uh, for your incidentals, so you were signing things uh, for me. But I'm not at the church anymore, so don't use that credit card. It's not going to not gonna oh, go. Oh, <laughs> I, 
I sent the card out on my Twitter yesterday. I'm sorry. Oh, well. It's going to be used all over the country now. Well, that's how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't do it. I promise. No more credit card use for you. All right. Credit card. All right. All right. Bless you all. Bless you all. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. That interview was so fun to do. Thank you again to Reverend Jim Wallace of Sojourners for being our guest tonight. And thank you to all of you for being our guests for camp meetings once again. Thank you for all of your grace and interest these last two months, even through our technical glitches. And a special thanks to Victor Zupang for being our guest musician tonight. Victor is one of our music worship leaders at Ridgefield United Methodist Church. Thank you to the Kennedys for their special permission to use Namaste. You can catch their weekly live Sunday concerts at youtube.com slash pnkennedy. And thank you to Brandon Larson, Exogenesis, for our introduction music. You can hear more at soundcloud.com slash weareexogenesis. I'm Reverend Nate Melcher of Richfield United Methodist Church in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In-person worship is suspended. You can get the details for online worship at richfieldumc.org slash live. Next week, Professor Matt Skinner of Luther Seminary will be here to talk about Acts of the Apostles and the Church of today and tomorrow. And you can stick around in tonight's episode for two bonus dad jokes from my kids after Victor takes us out with Namaste. Now friends, go into this world knowing that God loves you, that God creates something new in you every day, that Jesus is at the heart of reconciliation and the Holy Spirit comforts and gives you strength all of your days. And as our band leader, John Wesley would say, the best of all is God is with us. See you next time. Namaste. garden path When I meet with a tearful eye or a soulful laugh I give the same greeting to everyone It's really quite simple when it's said and done Namaste, namaste Domo arigato Namaste, namaste May you walk in peace Namaste, namaste divine in everyone you meet, yeah, 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 yeah. Forgive, forget, protect, and reassure. Your love's already there if your heart is pure. can grow in an open mind. Namaste, namaste, domo arigato, namaste, namaste, may you walk in peace. Namaste, namaste, domo arigato, acknowledge the divine in everyone you meet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Namaste. It's me, Gertie, and I want to do a dad joke. Why did the cra crab cross the road? Because the chicken was on vacation. Okay, this is be a quit melcher. Why did the cow cross cross the road? Because it wanted to go to the moon. That's time the show. Thanks for watching everything and judge.